What happened? It is. Right. So we're live. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name's Peter Hoban, and I'm an education officer at Sovereign Hill in Ballarat, and I'm also treasurer of Museums Australia Education. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be the host of our first Google Hangout. Uh, this afternoon, we're discussing constructivism in Australian museums with Dr. Louise Zamati. Uh, it's a bit of an experiment for us today because we're trialling Google Hangouts, and you can already see that we've had a couple of um, interesting sort of setup problems. But we're we're trialling it to see if it's a suitable way of presenting professional development for uh, our membership for the Museums Australia Education Group. Uh, as the Hangout implies, uh, the name implies it's just intended to be a fairly informal sort of form of communication. And at the end, we really would like to encourage you to uh, give us some feedback about how you think it went today. Now, I'd just like to introduce our panel. Now, first we have Andrew Hiskins, who's Manager of um, Learning Services Division at the State Library of Victoria. And Andrew was also President of May as well. So, over to you, Andrew. Hi, Pete. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, look, I think this is really exciting. I, one of the things that um, that we realised was a challenge um, when the new committee um, for Museums Australia Education, as it's now called, start, started, uh, we, we'd been handed a survey that had been um, done by the uh, the previous committee, which was really helpful in terms of uh, the kinds of things that people within the network valued, and and um, PD was high amongst those. Um, for a national network, um, which isn't sort of flooded with money, we can't fly people around, we can't do a whole lot of things. Um, being geographically distant is, is one of the major challenges. And so the really our, our key strategies to deal with that are to think about how our communications work. And um, recently we've launched a new website with which um, Christine, who you're about to meet, um, had um, has developed for us, uh, just as WordPress, WordPress blog. Uh, we decided we wanted to try and use Hangouts as a way of, um, of having these kinds of national conversations and also as a way of capturing those as something that we can put on the website um, later on and, and in a sense build up a library of resources that may be useful for, for people in, in, museums, in museums education more broadly. And the other thing was actually to look at ways in which we could provide or, um, and encourage state and territory groups to develop. So some already exist, some are embryonic, and some don't do exist at all. So that idea that there are people on the ground who can actually do programming as well, and we can support that in different ways, is part of that strategy. So that's all I want to say at the moment. But back to you, Pete. Cheers. Thanks, Andrew. Um, secondly, I'd like to introduce Christine Healy, who's Education Manager at Heidi Museum of Modern Art here in Melbourne. Uh, Christine also happens to be doing a doctorate uh, on museum education while being Secretary of May, and she's also our online guru, so she's a very, very busy woman. Now, Christine, you might have to turn your microphone on to say something. Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. Um, it's really good to be trying new technology like this and um, having everyone connect in different ways. Uh, sometimes you might notice that our heads go away and pictures appear, so we just have to deal with with um, the technology as it is, and um, there's nothing wrong when that happens. Um, it just means that someone's camera's dropped out, and hopefully they'll be back really quickly. So be patient with us, and hopefully the more of these we do, we'll get better at them. Um, thank you, and welcome. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Christine. Now, lastly, but probably most importantly, is our interviewee, Dr. Louise Zamati. Now, Louise has been a passionate history teacher in New South Wales for a number of years that I'm not allowed to say how long, Louise, and uh, she's been involved in the Big Dig Archaeological Centre in, in Sydney. Uh, she was awarded her doctorate in 2012, and a thesis looked at history, pedagogy, and practice in Australian museums. But look, personally, I'd like to thank Louise for her perseverance, because um, we've struggled to get this technology going over the last couple of weeks, and you've seen we've had some troubles tonight, but uh, she's hung in there with us through thick and thin. So thanks very much, Louise. That's why it's a hangout, Pete. Yep. <laughs> thanks for inviting okay. me, Pete. <clears throat> it's um, it's no wonderful to have, have an opportunity to talk about my thesis because I don't get to do it enough. Well, the, the whole point of this really is just to, to start talking about museum education and there are a few theses around and, you know, I don't think they get enough air. But look, having said that, that's a great segue. Tell us about your doctorate, you know, like what was the topic and how did you get involved in it? Well, I just so happen to have a nice little PowerPoint presentation here that I'll be able to share with you if things work well. So just let me get on here, uh, just a sec. 
and hopefully this will work. All right, so I'm hoping you'll be able to screen in a moment. Is, is that right? Can people see what see my screen? Um, Hello. Not, not really. Out? What I'm getting to see. We, we no, can you're, see. You're still there. Uh, wait a minute. Let me see if I can get it. All right. Can you see that? We can no, see black. Louise, you've probably got a couple of screens open, perhaps. Um, you'll need to no, get I think the pop-up. Um, it should be black with yellow. Can you can you see that? No, we can't see it. All right. Well, um, can you see me now or not? No. No. All right. Wait a minute. I'll get back. No. No, I wrecked it. Okay. Uh, just a minute. Oh. Sorry, that was supposed to go to my um, PowerPoint. All right, I have another go. Sorry about that. Just a sec, bear with me. All right, can you see me on the screen now? We can yeah. see you now. All right, that'll do. I'll just talk. We don't need Good. to have the PowerPoint. All right, um, Pete, can you just ask me the question again? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your thesis. Like, uh, how did you get involved, really, and what was it really all about? Okay, well, um, I had a background, as you, as you mentioned, um, many years as a history teacher and I've also worked as an archaeologist and I also worked as a museum educator doing archaeology and history. So I thought that in order to uh, do a, a, um, a PhD, a research PhD, I'd like to do something that covered all of those. And so I began in 2007 at Deakin University with Dr. Lindy Young, who I believe is online there now, listening. Um, and uh, I, I worked from 2007 to 2011, and I thought it was an opportunity to bring all this research together. And the um, the type of research that I did was uh, grounded theory, so it was based on interviewing uh, people working in museums and observations of their pedagogy and practice. Um, now, my, my thesis covered two basic areas and that was um, history pedagogy in secondary schools and museum education and professional praxis, which means that I was operating in two distinct cultures, learning cultures. And that in itself became a problem when I first started because with my literature review, the first six months I spent reading widely as one does when one is doing a PhD. And I found that um, the current discourse was very much based on primary school students and I was looking at secondary school students. It was pretty well all American um, examples. There were a couple in the UK. Well, there was some some um, examples in the UK, and I was looking at Australian museums. There didn't seem to be very much there. Uh, most of the research has been done in science museums, and I was looking at history museums. And most of it's been done on informal learning situations, and I was looking at formal learning. So, at about the six month um, stage, I started to feel very despondent because I realised that there wasn't very much there for me to base my research on. And so I took the advice of my supervisor and looked for the gap in knowledge and realised that there was a major gap in knowledge, that all this research had been done in areas that were, um, that were not uh, what I was doing. And so once I sort of changed my perspective, then I was able to proceed in a much more positive way. And so as a result of doing that um, literature review, I realised that what we have is a, a dominant paradigm in, in museum education research and that it's a constructivist learning paradigm and it's very much, as I said, focused on science museums and informal learning and so my research does something quite different to that. 
Um, that's very really interesting. You know, um, I started as a teacher as well, and I've been in museum education for 20 years, and I have never heard a teacher use the word constructivist learning. Um, and when I moved into the museum education area, and people were talking about constructivist learning as if I knew it was all, what it was all about, I absolutely had no idea, and I just pretended that I did. So, like, <laughs> what's your what's your understanding of constructivism, and how would you define it? Well, I agree. I, I felt like I was in foreign territory and it wasn't as if I'd um, operated as a history teacher in a sort of theoretical void. It's just that we seem to have um, a much broader range of theories that, that we looked at in our, um, you know, in, in teacher education and also in, in praxis. So I really had to go and look up and find out a whole lot more about constructivism. So I read fairly widely um, about constructivism. And my understanding is that it seems to be very much a grab bag of things. I mean, it's a very, very broad um, theory. And you've got the people, sort of radical constructivists like von Glassesfeld. You, you get that range of um, people who, who say that, uh, uh, peop that the learner should be able to construct their own knowledge um, without very much stimulus from other people or, or, or whatever. And then you've got others who uh, acknowledge that there is quite a bit of input from the educator. So there, I, I saw it as quite a, quite a range and, I, and it seemed very much to me as if people were constructing constructivism as they went. I, 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 yeah, I found it very confusing. But generally speaking, um, the, the idea of constructivism is that the learner is not a passive passive recipient of knowledge. Uh, the learner constructs knowledge from their own knowledge and experience, so they, they bring to their learning um, their, their own knowledge and experience. When you look at um, socio-constructivist learning theory, which is um, uh, very much the, um, uh, the George Hine model and um, various others, it, they, it's uh, based on learning learning taking place in social situations, so museums are very relevant to that. So um, groups of people visiting museums, school kids, family groups, um, couples, that sort of thing. Um, and knowledge and meaning is shared and some of the other main proponents of constructivism would be Piaget, Vygotsky and, as I mentioned, von Glassesfeld. So does that does that sound familiar to you, Pete? <laughs> I have obviously haven't read as widely as you have on on this whole topic, but you know uh, I'm interested sort of from the perspective that you you hear people talk about things like free choice learning in museums, you know, and it sort of strikes me that that's really based on a constructivist approach. Would that be right? Yes, that's that's absolutely correct. And um, again, that goes to um, you know to all that that research that was done. Um, in science museums where uh, people go in, it, it's like science works for example, where people go in, um, in in an informal situation, they're not guided at all through through the museum and they are given the opportunity to, to explore um, and that's based very much on their own interests and their own um, predilections. So there's no sort of um, set set out wayfaring or anything like that. They they're free to 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 choose what they want to learn, um, and that was a very different model to what I was looking at in museums because I was looking at um, I, I looked at formal learning programs like the ones that you offer at Sovereign Hill. In fact, you were one of my my people that I observed, Pete. And um, so what these programs were uh, very different in that respect. So the educators provided structured learning programs that responded to the curriculum, uh, that provided specific learning activities for the students and the educator was providing a service and that service was being paid for. So it was very, very different to that free choice um, learning model that, that we've seen so much um, in the, the uh, literature. Yeah, you know, I get a feeling that you see that there's sort of like a disconnect between what some museums are saying they're doing with constructivist learning and what they're actually doing when it comes to providing um, the more, con I was going to say constructed, but the more um, uh, uh, 
solid programming that schools need, the more tailored programming that schools need. Now, your thesis pointed out that there was a lot of other good practice in museums that didn't involve the constructivist approach, and uh, I wonder if you can give us some examples of what you saw actually operating in Australian museums. Okay, well, I just want to um, make it really clear that um, I don't, I, I, I acknowledge the, the positive ideas that the constructivist research has brought to museum education because it really has focused on the learner and, that, and that's really important. Um, and of course there's the, the work of Falk and Deaking and as I said George Hine and all that. And um, what I think the difference is with the models that I was looking at is that it is an entirely different model. It's a, it's a far more structured one and um, the programs that that, uh, that I looked at here in the history museums, um, as I said, they well, I, I can just read out the list of the museums I, I looked at. So it was Sovereign Hill, uh, Melbourne Museum, the Immigration Museum, Melbourne Museum of Sydney, Hyde Park Barracks, the National Museum of Australia, the Museum of Australian Democracy, the Australian War Memorial and Port Arthur Historic Site. So I, I did. Uh, I looked at nine in total, and I also wanted to have a couple that weren't just um, museums per se, but historic sites. So um, the Museum of, uh, sorry, Hyde Park Barracks and Port Arthur were, were two important um, authentic historic, um, archaeological historical sites. Um, so. Those programs that I looked at there, as I said, they respond to the curriculum. They offer only about one and a half to two hours. So they have to be very, very good at what they're doing because um, it has to be very succinct and very targeted. Um, it's an extension of what the kids are doing in the classroom usually. Um, teachers are prepared to pay for the program and one of the things that I did was I interviewed the teachers. Um, there was about 12 teachers um, and a total of 25 educators by the way that I interviewed and uh, the 12 teachers um, generally said that or indicated that they had very high expectations of the quality learning experiences that they wanted their students to have and when they didn't get that they were very critical. So. Um, so they also had very high expectations of the expertise of the educators. So when the educators didn't perform, they were also very critical of that. But generally speaking, they were very positive um, about the learning experiences that their students had. The, the delay in this is me actually turning my microphone back on for people just so that they know because I, if I don't turn it off, um, it keeps showing this ugly head on the, on the stage here. So, um, you know, uh, I really find what you're saying really interesting and you used a term in your, um, in your thesis that, uh, and I can't for the life of me remember it, but it was along the lines of, um, of uh, e educators in muse museums uh, creating a discourse or a discussion with students. Uh, I wonder if you've got a comment oh. and what, what's the word I was looking for? Yeah, I think it was um, dialogic interaction. Which is what you did, Pete. So the thing was that was that it—the dialogic re, uh, interaction. That's right. But feel free to talk about someone else apart from me. <laughs> okay. Well, I did see other people, um, and it was a dynamic that operated between the educator and the students, and uh, it was a question and answer uh, session. And when it was done well, it was very interesting and exciting and the marvellous thing about it when it was done well was that it pushed the kids to um, to the high levels of critical thinking that we we try to achieve in the classroom and especially with uh, with his historical inquiry method where using Bloom's taxonomy we try to get the, the kids to the level of um, being critical thinkers um, analyzing the sources, criticizing the sources and coming up with their own interpretations. So when the educators were doing that well, they would ask the kids open-ended questions and prompt them to think critically and to come up with their own interpretations. Fantastic. Um, Andrew, did you have a question or? Um, yes, I've just turned my mic back on too, so that's um, <laughs> that's good. Is it working? You can hear me? Um, yep. Uh, so, so it was actually, um, Louise, about about what the other theories of or practices that um, museum educators might might be focusing on, or or, co or could be focusing on in this regard. 
that's a good question, Andrew, because I, I think um, if we accept, first of all, that there are other models, there are models other than informal uh, learning situations, so that there are, are um, models like the ones that I looked at where, where we do have formal learning and and part of that being um, you know some didactic teaching I, I don't think that that's a terrible thing whereas I felt that um, constructivism it tends to be very critical of any didactic teaching and in most of the museums that I looked at there was a small amount of didactic teaching involved because the kids had to be prepped if you like on the uh, the historical background of the of the museum and um, you know what the artifacts were and what the collection was all about. So there was some active teaching on the part of the educators. So that's that's one of the things that I've, I think constructivism uh, in museum education really is a bit stuck, and it hasn't been open enough to uh, criticism. Where other discourses have been. Um, very very much open to criticism and debate and this has been around for about 30 years at least and it just seems to be have become axiomatic in, to my mind and so going back to my sort of other culture that I was talking about which is um, history education and, and history teaching and at the moment I, I, um, uh, I train history teachers uh, we go through a lot of Different theories and theorists. Um, so it's it's this. We offer um, the students, the pre-service uh, teachers, very much a smorgasbord of theory. So we look at, um, as I said, Vygotsky. Um, but I think with constructivism, we're not looking at the active teaching that Vygotsky talks about. And he he talks about things like um, the zone of proximal development, which is familiar to a lot of people where you, the educator pushes the kids to the point of inquiring to a much higher level and um, once the educator gets to that level then they can back off a bit and let the kids take um, their research further. So um, Bruner is another another one. Um, Howard Gardner's multiple inter intelligences theory um, is another very valuable one especially if you're looking at kinesthetic learners in the museum. You know, a lot of those programs were um, uh, using kinesthetic learning activities. Um, as I mentioned before, Bloom's taxonomy, um, getting kids to the level of higher order and creative thinking. Um, cognitive learning styles, um, historical inquiry method, there are, there's a quite a range that we could be looking at and I don't think they're really being um, examined enough because of this dominant discourse of constructivism. I think it, it. I mean, it's an interesting observation. I mean, you know, that that didactic can be okay as part of it because if you think about it, um, you know, if if you think of the, the the metaphor of constructivism, which is to build something, one of the things about building something is that you need a good foundation, and that foundation mm -hmm. is often something that you ju that you just need to you need to kind of you know compact it and ram it ram it home so that it's good and solid. If you think about say say studying maths. I mean, there's no one I think who would argue that it would be a good idea to um, to to just sort of through trial and error and so on work out the times table every time you need to know how to do multiplication. So I think there are certain things where where there's a clear argument that says you just got to do the hard yards and learn that bit. And I think that that's an interesting thing to think of in terms of what are the what are the foundational things that you need people to have a good sense of so that they can make the most of their experience within a museum context. I, I like that metaphor. That's a really good one about you know having that foundation to construct knowledge. I, th I think it's really good. And the other thing is that um, because the educators are working within a very limited time frame to be able to capture their audience and entertain them and to get them to learn stuff, uh, they've got to be able to synthesize the most important information into, um, into to something that's meaningful for the kids in a very short amount of time and it takes quite uh, a lot of skill to be able to do that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, Pete? Yeah, no, I was very interested in uh, your discussions in your um, uh, thesis where you were talking about, you know, the role of the the, pre the 
the teacher as opposed to a presenter, you know, and and their skill level. And you know, I find it really interesting um, the the discussion between sort of like the link between free choice learning and formal learning. And I see our example here at Sovereign Hill is that you know that one hour that you're talking about that we have with kids is very much a didactic sort of situation where you know we are using what we consider to be some. Um, uh, really uh, good teachers to actually suck kids in and get kids involved and one of the skills that they have is the ability to be able to read their audience and be able to read where kids are going and what they need but also the ability to read when the kids are getting bored and and they have a, a quiver of a huge range of activities that they can actually use to actually uh, interest the kids I suppose but the other one for me is this sort of more informal learning business and, and that's more we have a thing We've given away all of our trails at Sovereign Hill, and we've we've got rid of them because um, we, we're sort of listening to Jeanette Griffin's stuff, you know. And Jeanette Griffin is saying that trails are, are more of a control mechanism than they are of a learning mechanism. And so, what we're trying to do in our what we now call our uh, discover it yourself learning is to employ some of these other sort of um, theorists that you're talking about. So we've done stuff about multiple intelligences, we've done stuff about uh, blooms and, and all, that, all that sort of gear, which teachers are much, much more familiar with than they are with con than constructivism. And we really um, go to the, the rallying call of um, Jeanette Griffin when she talks about purpose, choice and ownership. And it's that purpose. That's the purpose is the most important thing, and you know I, I get the feeling that a, a purist constructivist approach would have very little purpose, whereas you know a formal uh, approach has got much more purpose. And and what we're really on about uh, as much as possible of trying is trying to get a righteous pur purpose for students to actually do something when they're here, and something that actually means um, something to them. If we then give them choices about how they go about it, or or, or what what technologies they use, etc., then they actually take the ownership of it eventually. But it's that purpose at the beginning that is the, really the most important thing. Anyway, I'll get off the soapbox and see what you think about that. Well, first of all, I think you're absolutely right about the um, the skill of the educator. I use the term educator rather than um, guide or interpreter or whatever because I, th I think it really empowers um, the people who teach in museums um, because I think Sometimes they're given titles that are that don't really describe what they do, um, and it doesn't really necessarily acknowledge their expertise in in their professional um, position in in museums. But that's another part of my thesis that I'd like to get into at another time. Um, so I think it's not just a matter of being able to learn a script verbatim and deliver that. A good teacher or a good educator is, as you said, able to uh, to read the students and see what mood they're in and um, whether they've been on a plane or something or a bus for you know four or five hours to get to Canberra and they're exhausted and they're not open to learning. Um, the educator has to be able to shift gears and cater to that that sort of situation. So so very important issue. Um, and I think the, the work that Jeanette Griffin has done is um, is really important and um, it's interesting because she comes from a, very much a constructivist science based um, uh, theoretical background but I think she also brings in brings to it an understanding, a very clear understanding of the importance of the role of the educator um, as part of the whole learning experience and um, so that, that brings me on to, um, because I was doing grounded theory, I, I really had to come up with some sort of a theory at the end of all this research. And what I ended up with was uh, I, I sort of melted it down to, to one sort of framework and that was um, what I called a history pedagogy model that I saw the educators using. And it was very clearly an in, uh, a dynamic interaction that went three ways and it was the interaction between the uh, the educator, the learner and the knowledge and I think my criticism of constructivism is that it has, con it, it has concentrated too much on the learner only and not acknowledged the role of the educator um, in the whole process of learning in these um, 
in these formal situations in museums. And I would take it even further than that to even with an in, informal situation in a museum, the educators and the, and the curators um, are actually structuring the learning activities for people when they come into the museum because they're, they're, they're setting up the, the, um, uh, the displays and they're, they're writing the labels and also they are really constructing learning. So I think it's important to, to see that uh, dynamic operating in the three parts in museums. Fantastic. Look, um, let's say you have the opportunity to speak to a whole pile of museum managers, right? Uh, what, what would be the sort of most important uh, advice you could give them to, you know, how, how do they run an, a really effective education program? And I'm not talking about a program that's just going to bring heaps of kids through the door. I'm talking about a program that is actually really going to kick goals in terms of learning. What, what would your advice be to those management people? Right. Well, the first thing I'd do is I'd say they have to make sure that they've got quality teach, a uh, quality teaching and learning experience for the kids. And, and by um, in order to do that, I think, uh, well, I'll say specifically in relation to history, they need to have some sort of link to what is going on in the classroom. So whether that be with the curriculum. So we now have the new national curriculum, the Australian curriculum in history and science and um, Geography, maths, and, and what's the other one? English. Uh, so some sort of link in with the curriculum. So the kids don't see, or the kids do see the learning that they're doing in the museum as having some sort of a link with what they're doing back uh, in the classroom. Um, it needs to be a fun learning experience, something different to what they're doing at school, even though it's linked to maybe the topics that they're doing something that is really exciting. So if they have access to authentic, rare artifacts, that is particularly exciting. And, and kids love to, to be able to handle things that are really old and ancient and, and things that have come from significant historical events. So something that's really whiz-bang and exciting, I think, is important. Um, the feedback from the teachers was that they really did not like it when the educators only lectured and they talked too much when they talked at the kids and the kids tuned out and that was really obvious. Um, so don't talk too much to, to the kids. A little bit of talk, set them up for their learning and give them something active to do. Um, make sure you're interacting with them, you're really positive in the, in the way you interact. Have a sense of humour, they love that. That was another thing that both um, students and, and teachers commented on. They really enjoyed the educators who made them laugh and, and um, feel happy. And I think finally push the kids to think critically. We live in a democratic society. Uh, the new curriculum is focused on that whole idea of critical thinking. Make the kids think. Make them be critical when they come to the museum. And then in that way they'll get their money's worth. Fantastic. I'm going to keep this tape and show it to our management. <laughs> um, <laughs> Christine, uh, do we have a question? Yes, we do. So um, Natalie Saab has asked the question and she's a student studying Masters of Teaching in the hopes of becoming a museum educator. And she's asking what skill set and knowledge base going forward would Louise recommend in order to be able to connect with students um, coming specifically through museum education system. We could do a whole um, hangout on that topic alone. I think we could. Well, I think, first of all, you have, um, Natalie would need to be, she'd have to have very sound knowledge of the historical period that she's working in. So if she goes into um, an Australian museum, she has to know her material back to front because sometimes the ki if the kids are thinking critically they're going to ask questions out of left field and that's what we want them to do. So have very sound historical knowledge. Um, have very sound pedagogical knowledge. So have a very rich toolkit that you can take with you into the museum so that you can be prepared to handle any opportunity that comes up, any challenge that comes up from the kids. Uh, be able to think on your feet. That's really, really important. Um, 
anything else you can think of? Um, yeah, know your museum really well. Know what's really fun and exciting and mind blowing. What's really going to get the kids excited about the museum? Um, uh, and I'd use that. I'd agree with you that you need a really good sense of humour too, and you actually need yeah. to like kids. Um, you know, if you like kids, then um, that actually comes through. You know, uh, there's been a lot of middle years research and development stuff done in, in uh, Victoria that sort of came to the conclusion that particularly at year nine level, it's all about relationships. And if kids think that you actually like them, they'll jump through hoops for you. But if, if they think you're pretending, they'll kill you. And so it's about you know enjoying the situation, having fun with kids, and we've only got them for an hour, so it's, it's, I think we're blessed at times with this job. I think it's the most marvellous thing I could possibly do. And be prepared to dress up in strange costumes, I think. That's another thing. <laughs> yeah. Pete does that all the time. Have you got mm. your bonnet yes. there, Pete? <laughs> I have got the bonnet. <laughs> But oh, look, I thought we'd try and maintain a bit of decorum this afternoon, Andrew, and I was hoping not to have to wear it, really. <laughs> the top hat would be good, Pete. Oh, it's, it's here. Don't worry. <laughs> there we go. It just doesn't fit on the headphones, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, look, um, uh, we, it's probably time to start wrapping up. Um, uh, I'm interested, Christine, uh, how would could those who have been watching, how can they sort of provide some future feedback for us or in the future some feedback to us about how we went tonight and, and uh, you know, what we might do otherwise? So people can add some comments on our Google Plus Facebook page, or Google Plus page on our Facebook page, on our Twitter accounts um, by connecting with us through social media and, and letting us know what they thought of it, um, what they're getting out of it, what they'd like to see. Um, that's probably the, the best way to get in touch and, and give us some feedback and join the conversations and we can continue them on on, on social media. Look, um, can I just say a really big thank you to you, Louise, because it's uh, it's been a trying sort of thing at various times to get this technology to work, but I, I hope we've done a pretty good job. I, I hope um, people have enjoyed it. And uh, you've been a real trooper to... to um, put up with all of the, the problems that we've had and what you've said has been really interesting and that's what we're hoping to do is to get a really interesting speaker for starters. So look, thank you very much. Um, I'm wondering if someone can go into the Google, um, what is it, you know, can someone organise a, a round of applause <laughs> in the Google effects? Hang on, I'm trying to get this thing happening. Andrew's trying to do it at the same time, I can see. Uh, hang on. Nearly there. Can I also say something? Um, I just want sure. to thank um, the three of you for taking us to this new level with uh, Museums Australia Education because it's really important that we, that we start having these conversations as, as educators um, at a national level. It's, it's really important that, that we um, make our presence felt. Um, as professionals in, in museums. So thanks, guys, for doing this. This is really important. Good on you, Louise. Thank you yeah, very no, much. Yeah, absolutely. Now, thank uh, you. And, and yes, and we're very excited about it too. <laughs> um, lastly, for those other people that are listening, if you know of any other potential speakers or topics you'd like us to try and cover, uh, we're really interested in getting some feedback about that because we're not the uh, owners of all the knowledge of, of what's happening in museum education. So uh, we would really like a bit of feedback about where you'd like to go from here. Now, can I throw um, just about lastly to Andrew, um, what sort of future events and resources have we got planned for Museums Australia Education? Hang on, Andrew, you might need to turn your I've microphone. just turned. No, it's OK. I've done that. Um, OK, so um, one of the things that I would recommend people do is to um, go to our website, which is museumsaustraliaeducation.wordpress.com, um, and actually subscribe to that if they want to be kept up to date. Um, I mean, one of the things that's important about that is, obviously, we're part of Museums Australia. We would like to encourage people to become members of Museums Australia, but we understand that there are some people who work for organisations who are, who are um, corporate members, and, um, and there are other reasons why people may not 
um, have, have, have joined, but clearly we still want to communicate with everyone who works in this area because that's how we, how we create value. So one of the things I would recommend is to, to go and have a, have a look at that and, and to sort of have a look at the, the, um, the events and things that we've got coming up. One thing that um, I will point to is um, we have a pre-conference day prior to the Museums Australia um, National Conference in, in Launceston in May. So the conference um, starts on the Saturday and we have a, a pre-conference day on the Friday. It's um, free of charge, so anyone who's actually attending the conference can um, uh, follow the link from the um, Museums Australia Education website to um, uh, go to Eventbrite and actually book for that, um, which I'd encourage you to do. We are looking for some additional speakers as part of that as well, so if you have an interest in, in speaking or being part of the panels, on because we've got panels under an, a range of different topics, uh, which you can and see if you go and have a have a look at the link there. Um, that would be that would be terrific as well. So that that program is called May Day um, because that was the reason that we decided to call muse what used to be Museums Australia Education National Network or Maine. We decided um, to to call it May instead because it gave us all sorts of opportunities for plays on words. And and you can see Pete Peter's. Pete was smiling in my screen because um, because he's been having a lot of fun playing playing with that as well. Um, have I missed anything, Christine um, or or Pete? Is there anything else that we should be saying before we we sign off on that? No, I think we've covered it all. Um, thank you very much to Louise. That's just been fantastic to listen to, and really adds to the conversation and gave me lots of things to think about in regards to to my own studies and research as well. So, look forward to talking to you about it more. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to do that, you know. It's just a fantastic facility, you know. <laughs> um, look, can, can we sign off now and just say thank you to all those um, who've been watching um, uh, and I'll get each of you individually to say uh, to sign off and then we'll get Christine to stop broadcasting but uh, we might stay on for a couple of minutes if you've got a couple of minutes just to debrief yep. for a second. So okay. it's good thank night for me. Bye, everyone. Okay. Bye. Bye. Oh, my God.